Welcome everybody to another installment of our workshop on entrepreneurial finance and innovation seminar series. We are excited to have Camille Hebert here to present some work on learning from errors in entrepreneurship. Let me give you a quick overview of the logistics before I hand things over to her. Uh, so she'll have uh, 40 minutes. Every 10 minutes or so, um, she may pause and I'll or Song will collect some of the questions in chat. So use the chat for questions, both clarifying and deep. Uh, and then we'll take, we'll switch over to the discussion, which will be 15 minutes. And then after that, we'll have a 10 to 12 minute uh, open Q&A. Feel, feel free to stay around for that. So with that, I will hand it off to Camille. So thank you very much, uh, Mike, uh, for the introduction and for also including uh, my paper on this very uh, exciting uh, seminar series. So I'm very happy to be here and thanks everyone for joining us uh, today. So the data I'm going to present today is at a fairly preliminary stage. So I'm very looking forward to uh, David's comments and uh, um, any thoughts or any comments at this stage would be uh, super valuable. So thanks for being here. So as the title suggests, so I'm interested in learning in entrepreneurship and uh, I'm going to focus on a specific type of learning, which is learning uh, from uh, past errors. So the starting point of this uh, paper is the fact that a substantial part of young firms don't survive. So as you can see on this graph, so after five years, so only 68% uh, of young firms uh, still exist. And after 10 years, it's about 50%. Uh, and actually, so this is, you know, the trend for uh, all firms uh, in France. But if I split the distribution by the employment size at start after one year, so we see, you know, similar figures. Uh, so after five years, like, you know, uh, a few firms survive and, uh, and same for uh, after uh, 10 years. So, so here I'm using uh, micro data from uh, France, but actually, you know, if we look at, uh, at the trends for over developed countries, such as uh, the US or Canada, so we would find like very similar uh, trends. And it's actually striking to see uh, the numbers. So I was, uh, you know, interested in understanding, you know, why so few firms uh, survive after a few years. And one possible uh, hypothesis is the fact that entrepreneurs must make choices and often with incomplete information, uncertainty about the future. And they may also start you know, with limited experience about uh, founding a company or about like the, start, uh, the sector they start uh, in. And as a result, uh, entrepreneurs must experiment and possibly make mistakes, which could be an opportunity to learn from their past errors. And some entrepreneurs do learn and some entrepreneurs uh, don't. And actually, you know, this view that failure could be a good thing has been quite popular in the media and especially in North America. So, for example, uh, this article from uh, The Economist uh, suggests that you should fail often uh, to fail well. Uh, or this is also the view of uh, Elon Musk and this quote. So failure is an option here. If things are not failing, you are, you are not innovating uh, enough. And maybe that was the problem of this guy who... Uh, was maybe too innovative for uh, creating a bike with uh, squared uh, wheels, but it could also be you know, an opportunity to learn uh, for him. Um, so in this paper, so I'm going to focus on a very specific type of mistakes that I can observe and that I can measure. And by that, I mean uh, expectation errors that entrepreneurs uh, make when they form expectations about the future prospect of their company. And I'm going to ask two main questions. So first of all, how accurate are entrepreneurs' beliefs about their own uh, business future prospects? And the second question is, do entrepreneurs learn over time from their past uh, errors? And understanding how entrepreneurs form their beliefs has important implications. So at a micro level, it matters to explain their own success, uh, the future development of their startup, but also you know, for employees who work at these uh, firms. And from a macro perspective, uh, pervasive uh, biases uh, may affect the aggregate outcomes, may lead to misallocation of resources. And from a theoretical point of view, it may be a deviation from the rational uh, expectations uh, equilibrium. Um, so one motivation for this study is the fact that there is very little empirical evidence of learning, especially in a corporate finance setting. So we have like some evidence of learning in asset pricing or uh, in experimental studies, but very few in uh, corporate finance. And the major challenges are the reason why uh, the reason why we have very few empirical evidence is the fact that 
um, we need you know, a way to identify uh, learning uh, patterns in the data. So that's why I'm going to focus on expectation errors. And one needs you know, to observe uh, expectations, not only at one point in time, but you know, to have like the dynamics of uh, expectations to say something about uh, learning. So what do I do in this paper? So I formalize the idea of learning from past errors in a model of uh, Bayesian updating. So I use French administrative data and in particular, this uh, large scale survey of entrepreneurs that is representative of the population of French entrepreneurs. So one uh, specificity of this data set is that it is a panel of individual expectations about future hiring and development uh, prospects. And uh, I should define uh, right now, you know, one important variable that I'm going to, to uh, that I'm going to use in this study, which is the expectation error. That is like the difference between uh, the expectation that is formed by the entrepreneur and the realized growth that is uh, observed uh, in the next uh, period. And we can distinguish between two types of errors. So first of all, an optimistic error, which corresponds to the case uh, of uh, the realized growth that is uh, lower than what was predicted or what was expected by the entrepreneur. And the second uh, type of error is uh, what I will call a pessimistic error, which is the case where the expectation is actually lower than the realized growth. So basically, the entrepreneur here underestimate what is going to be the prospect of the firm. Um, so I have three main results in the paper. So First of all, I'll show you that most entrepreneurs make optimistic or pessimistic uh, expectation errors. And this is something that is quite new given you know, the view that uh, most entrepreneurs are uh, optimistic. But here, because I have like the population of entrepreneurs, so basically it may be you know, closer to the uh, population of individuals in general. Uh, the second result um, is the fact that entrepreneurs learn from their past expectation errors. And I have like three pieces of evidence consistent with this interpretation. So first of all, um, making errors leads to updates of expectation uh, within individuals. So after making an error, uh, entrepreneurs are more likely you know, to uh, change their expectation in the next uh, wave of the survey. Uh, the second uh, piece of evidence is the fact that updating leads to less error in the future. So entrepreneurs who update their expectation, they are less likely to make errors in the future. But these two pieces of evidence could still be you know, uh, consistent with a mean reverting pattern. So entrepreneurs, you know, they, they say something and in the next period they say the opposite, so which could be you know, just a mean reverting fact. But I think like the third piece of evidence is, uh, speaks against this fact. And I'll show you that uh, the, likelihood of, the likelihood of making errors declines uh, uh, over time uh, within individuals. So entrepreneurs who uh, made uh, errors in the past, they are less likely to make uh, errors uh, again in the future. And in the last part of the paper, so I'll show you that uh, expectation errors and learning from them have uh, real effects on uh, corporate uh, performance. Um, okay, so maybe let's, let's talk a little bit you know, about alternative channels that may have come to mind. Uh, so first of all, you know, there is this view in the entrepreneurship literature that entrepreneurs who start are optimistic. But uh, in the paper, so I'll show you that a substantial part of entrepreneurs actually underestimate their uh, future prospects. And uh, also, you know, optimistic and pessimistic types are persistent over time across individuals. So, for example, if you start as an optimistic entrepreneur, you are likely, you know, to remain optimistic. And if you start as pessimistic, you are likely to remain uh, pessimistic uh, in the future, even though the likelihood of making errors within individuals declines over time. Um, so second, so entrepreneurs may have uh, different unobservable abilities to learn, and this could, you know, potentially explain, you know, the, the fact that some update and others don't. But I include individual fixed effects in the in the regression, so to capture, you know, for these fixed characteristics of, uh, of, of individuals. Um, another alternative could be the fact that entrepreneurs may learn from other uh, signals, or they may update because the state of the world has changed. But I include uh, sector times time uh, fixed effect to control, you know, for a sector uh, level uh, shocks. Um, another concern could be the fact that entrepreneurs do not truthfully answer the survey. Uh, but the fact that I observe some variation within individual over time, I think, speaks against this argument. 
also the survey is anonymous. It is sent by the Statistical Institute that is independent from the government. So um, uh, basically entrepreneurs may not have like strong incentive you know, to lie and, to, and not to report uh, truthfully their answers. Uh, also, you know, as pointed out by Bertrand and Mulanetten, so the, the, some, some entrepreneurs who may uh, say something random uh, may cancel out, you know, at the aggregate uh, in the large, uh, in large sample. And uh, finally, entrepreneurs who fail uh, do, ne do not take the survey anymore, so which may create a survival uh, bias uh, in the data. So, for example, if uh, someone fails after three years, so uh, the Statistical Institute uh, will not be able, you know, to locate the entrepreneur, and the entrepreneur won't uh, take the survey. So basically. I cannot observe, you know, the learning pattern for these people because they simply uh, don't exist anymore. Um, but what I, I find is that optimistic and pessimistic errors are negatively correlated with survival. So suggesting that entrepreneurs who learn are the ones who have made mistakes and the ones who have made mistakes, they are less likely to survive. So actually the bias uh, would go uh, I mean, against me. Uh, so in that sense, uh, it may be uh, less of a concern. And uh, second, so basically studying uh, the dynamics of individual expectation necessitate a panel uh, data set. So in that sense, it's like a, you know, a necessary condition uh, to study learning, uh, to be able you know, to, uh, to have a panel and potentially a survival uh, bias. Um, okay, before I post for uh, the question, so let me just tell you, you know, what are uh, the, uh, the main contributions of uh, this study. So, there is this large literature about biased beliefs of managers, entrepreneurs, analysts, and I should point out uh, two papers that focus on uh, entrepreneurs. So there is the paper by uh, Augustin Landier and uh, David Tesmar about like the capital structure of optimistic entrepreneur that actually uses the, the same. I'm, I'm using the same data, and there is also uh, the paper by Manjou Puri and David Robinson. Uh, that shows that uh, um, entrepreneurs are moderately uh, optimistic relative uh, to more optimistic relative to the general population. And my contribution relative to this uh, literature is the fact that here I observe like a, popul a representative population of entrepreneurs. And I show that basically entrepreneurs start with more heterogeneous beliefs than uh, what we may have thought uh, uh, before, so some entrepreneurs are optimistic, but we also have like a substantial part of entrepreneurs who underestimate uh, their uh, their prospects, and in that sense, they are not all uh, optimistic. So my paper also contributes to this uh, rapidly growing literature about belief formation, and I show that entrepreneurs form new beliefs after making uh, an error. Uh, it is also related to this uh, literature about learning in financial markets and uh, also to this small literature about experimentation in uh, entrepreneurship that basically shows that uh, entrepreneurs view uh, experimentation or continuation uh, experimentation as a real option which predicts continuation and what i show is that uh, correcting uh, biased beliefs uh, is basically associated with continuation so we may conclude that entrepreneurs who experiment and entrepreneurs who correct uh, their biased beliefs or who learn may be the same, but it's still, I think, an open question. So is there any question that I could uh, uh, answer? So there, yeah, there are a few. Um, let me see if I can pick. Some of these are a little deeper, so I'm, gonna, I'm not ignoring your questions because I don't think they're important to clarify. Uh, I think you'll get to this, but who are these entrepreneurs? You're going to talk about the sample soon, right? Yeah, yeah. I will. Okay, well, we'll get okay. to that. So I'll delay you. Yeah, okay. Um, and then I think you're going to define the, the forecast error a little bit more later yeah. as well. Um, and then, yeah, I think that's, so uh, Naveen has a question. I'm curious whether the entrepreneurs who reduce their prediction errors also become better entrepreneurs. Uh, is that something you want to talk about now or in the future? Yeah, uh, at the end of the talk, but uh, yes, I'll, uh, I'll answer this question. Okay, so thank, thank you very much for, for the question and sorry for delaying all of them, but um, I'll, uh, I, I should talk about that. Okay, um, so before I uh, show you the empirical results, so let me, you know, tell you uh, how I designed the, the test uh, in this paper. So. Uh, basically, so I uh, write like a simple model of learning in entrepreneurship. And the first question is how do entrepreneurs form expectations about the next growth period? So the next growth period, this uh, delta xt is basically the expectation that is formed at time t plus, uh, you know, news or an error. Uh, and uh, basically a Bayesian entrepreneur uses the history of past growth uh, to estimate 
uh, the, this uh, parameter mu, that is the, the subjective uh, expectation, that is uh, the weighted average of uh, past uh, growth in the data. And I can rewrite, rewrite uh, this expression uh, with a recursive representation with decreasing gain. So this is very standard, and this is actually very similar to what Mamandi and Nagel do in their paper. So I obtained this equation. The only difference with this paper is this uh, term here that could be interpreted as the average corporate growth. And the reason why it is different is that here, so basically, I'm predicting uh, the, uh, the growth of their own business and not the growth of a macro variable such as inflation, for instance. So that's why I need to adjust for this uh, term. Um, I can rewrite uh, this expression this way and uh, find a relationship between uh, the expectation update and the past uh, error here. And uh, I can define two types of uh, past error. Uh, the first one is an optimistic error, which corresponds to the case of like an expectation that is higher than the realization that will be uh, observed in the next period. And uh, the second type of error is a pessimistic error, and that's the opposite case. So it's basically when the realized growth observed in the next period is uh, higher than uh, the expectation which leads me uh, to the hypothesis I'm going to test in the data. So the null hypothesis is gamma is equal to zero, meaning that there is no relationship between the update and the past error. So entrepreneurs don't learn anything from their past errors. Uh, not that it, this is also the case uh, if the entrepreneur perfectly predicts the next uh, period growth. So basically, if the entrepreneur doesn't make any mistake, he doesn't learn anything. Okay, so this will be equal to zero. And uh, so, and uh, my hypothesis is that there is like a positive uh, correlation between the update and the past error, meaning that the entrepreneur learns from uh, past errors. So I'm going to estimate this equation uh, using OLS, and uh, I'm going to include individual dummies uh, to control for this average corporate growth, plus uh, sector times time uh, dummies uh, to control for the arrival of macro news or uh, shocks uh, at, the, uh, at the sector level. Okay, so in terms of data, I use uh, French administrative data from the French Bureau of Statistics. Uh, so I use the tax files that are available for every firm in France every year. Uh, they contain the balance sheet and income statements of firms. Uh, plus, uh, I augment uh, the data set uh, with the match employer employee data, uh, data set. Um, and the main data source in, in my study is the CINE survey that is conducted on cohorts. Uh, so I use five cohorts uh, in, in, the, in the study. And this is a five-year panel. So, um, so entrepreneurs so this receive uh, the survey several times over five years. So in fact, three times. Uh, the survey is also uh, representative of the, of the, it's a representative sample of the population of new firms, at least at start, you know, if they fail, so then it's not representative anymore, but at least when uh, the survey uh, at the beginning, it is representative, and uh, in each uh, cohort year, 25% of the startups create, created within a year uh, take the survey. The response rate is very high because it is uh, run by the fiscal administration. And per cohort, I start with 30 to 50,000 uh, new entrepreneurs. Uh, I should say that this um, survey has been used in two uh, studies to date, so in the paper by uh, Augustin and David and in my job market paper. Okay, so let's talk about like the main variables I use in the in, in the study. So, uh, so I define. I mean, we already talked about like this expectation error. That is the difference between the expectation and the real, realized growth. So two types of expectation errors: optimistic if the entrepreneur overestimates his prospects, and pessimistic error if the entrepreneur underestimates uh, his prospects. So I need two pieces of information. Uh, so the first one is the expectation that is formed at the end of year T. Uh, so I extract this information from this question. So in the survey, entrepreneurs have to, to, to tell, uh, to say, so do you plan to hire over the next 12 months? And they can say yes, no, or I don't know. So I code this variable hiring expectation one if the answer yes, I will hire over the, uh, in, the in the next 12 months and zero if they don't. I take out like the I don't know answer. And for the development uh, expectation, so the question is, what do you plan to do over the, uh, the next six months? So they can say, I want to develop the company. 
I want to maintain the current balance, to recover from a difficult situation, to shut down the company or to sell. So I code this variable as one if they say, yes, I want to develop the company and uh, zero if they answer something else. So I take out again, like the I don't know answer, um, which could be useful, you know, if we want to study, uh, for example, uncertainty, but it's not something I do uh, at the moment. Uh, and the second piece of information I need to create this expectation error variable is the realization threshold at t uh, plus one, so one year after. So I follow uh, what uh, Augustin and David uh, did in their paper. So uh, the uh, employment growth uh, and the threshold should be uh, higher than one. So if the company said, yes, I mean, yes, I want, so for example, an, an optimistic error would be an entrepreneur who say, yes, I want to hire uh, people uh, over uh, the next 12 months. And actually, uh, we observe that the employment uh, growth has been zero. So basically, they haven't hired anyone uh, uh, more. And the second, uh, second example would be, uh, for example, someone who says, uh, yes, I want, uh, no, I mean, no, I don't want to develop uh, the company uh, at all. And actually, we observe that in the next year, the company uh, has, sell, has sold 5% uh, uh, more uh, uh, than uh, the period uh, before. Okay, and the, the, oh, the last uh, variable that is important in my study is this update of expectations. So basically, if the entrepreneur change what he says in terms of uh, hiring or development expectations uh, between uh, the different waves of the survey, and we can uh, observe um, up, upward update or downward uh, updates uh, depending on, on what they say. Okay, so just a few descriptive statistics. So in the raw data, so we observe that um, cer only 39% of entrepreneurs uh, say, yes, I want to develop the company. Only 24% of them say, yes, I want to hire uh, someone. Okay, and then uh, I can uh, calculate, you know, this optimistic error or pessimistic error. And I observe that 21% of entrepreneurs actually make uh, an, uh, an optimistic error in terms of uh, development and 36% uh, uh, make optimistic errors in terms of uh, also development, uh, pessimistic errors in terms of uh, development here. Okay, and we observe that, you know, like this is, these optimistic or uh, pessimistic errors are actually uh, distributed like across different industries. For example, in the information and communication, we observe a lot of optimistic entrepreneurs and uh, not a lot of uh, pessimistic entrepreneurs, for instance, or in the medical industry. So there are a lot of uh, entrepreneurs who underestimate uh, their prospects and, uh, and not a lot that overestimate uh, their prospects. In terms of updates, so I find that 38% of entrepreneurs actually change their expectation over time or update and uh, 23 uh, also update. And uh, basically the goal of this study is going to see uh, whether there is like a relationship between entrepreneurs who change their expectation over time and uh, the errors they made uh, in the past. So this is uh, the equation that I'm going to test. And I'll show you three pieces of evidence uh, in line uh, or, uh, that we could interpret as uh, learning within individuals. So I'll show you a positive relationship between the likelihood of updating and uh, the likelihood of making an error. Um, I'll show you that after uh, an update, entrepreneurs are less likely to make errors and also that errors decline uh, over time uh, within individuals. So I'll show you, uh, you know, uh, some, uh, some correlations between some fixed characteristics of entrepreneurs and the update. So basically who updates and at the end of the talk, so uh, we'll, uh, uh, I'll show you, you know, some evidence, of, some evidence of real effects of making errors and uh, learning. So maybe I should pause here and see if there are any questions. Uh, the, uh, David actually handled one of them, so I think we're okay. <laughs> we can okay. keep going. <laughs> okay. So in terms of the results, so this is uh, the first uh, test I do here. So. I look at uh, basically, you know, the update uh, of expectation within uh, individual and, uh, and I correlate it with the past error. Uh, yeah, I also include in this uh, version of the table, uh, the uh, sector times uh, year uh, fixed effect to control, you know, for uh, unexpected news that may uh, arrive at the uh, sector level. 
And uh, what I find is that after making an optimistic error, entrepreneurs are more likely uh, to update. So here and here. Uh, but after making a pessimistic error, entrepreneurs are less likely to update, which suggests that basically uh, pessimistic uh, attitudes or pessimistic attitudes are more sticky uh, than optimistic uh, errors, uh, which is actually consistent with, uh, for example, what Camilla Cullen finds in her paper about asymmetric learning. So uh, um, entrepreneurs or individuals, they are more likely, you know, to react after a bad news, which is the case, you know, if the entrepreneur made an optimistic error uh, than uh, after a pessimistic error. And now if we dig, I mean, if we separate between um, positive update and negative update, I find that after making an optimistic error, entrepreneurs are uh, less likely to, uh, to update upward, you know, to make like a positive ex uh, expectation. And they are uh, less likely to update downward, which goes in the right uh, direction. And we find the opposite in uh, after making a pessimistic error. So entrepreneurs who made uh, who underestimated their prospects, they are more likely to update upward in the next period, and they are less likely to update downward in the next period, which is consistent. I mean, which is basically what we could have expected. So entrepreneurs who made optimistic errors are more likely to update their expectation downwards and the opposite for uh, pessimistic errors. Second test, so I correlate uh, the likelihood of uh, future errors uh, with the update. And uh, I find that after uh, making a positive update or an update upward, uh, entrepreneurs are more likely to make optimistic errors, but they are less likely to make pessimistic errors. And uh, after uh, making uh, um, an update uh, downwards, uh, downwards, they are uh, less likely to make an optimistic error than they are more likely to make a pessimistic error, which again goes in uh, the direction we could have expected. But these two results that I showed you could still be you know, consistent with the mean reverting uh, pattern in the data. So in the third uh, test, so basically I look at uh, the likelihood of making an error uh, and uh, the fact that they made uh, errors in the past. And I find that within individuals, so here I include like, again, individual fixed effect, I find that entrepreneurs are less likely to make errors over time uh, within individual. Um, yeah, so I include uh, individual fixed effect here. And uh, now I'm going to remove the individual fixed effect, you know, to be able, you know, to correlate uh, the, uh, the error with some uh, fixed characteristic of entrepreneurs. Um, oh, and before that, so before I show you, you know, the correlation between uh, the likelihood of making an error and uh, the, the fixed control. So let me uh, show you uh, what happens in terms of, um, uh, of uh, in terms of past errors and errors like across individuals. So what I find is that there is like a positive correlation uh, across uh, individuals which suggests that pessimistic and optimistic types are persistent uh, over time across individuals. So basically, if you made optimistic errors in the past, so you are likely you know, to remain optimistic, even though the likelihood of making errors declines within individuals, but compared to other people you know, in your cohort or in your sector, so you are still more optimistic than them. So basically, optimistic and pessimistic types are persistent across uh, individuals. Okay, so now let me uh, show you, you know, the correlation between uh, errors and the fixed characteristic of entrepreneurs. So basically, who makes errors? So I find that female entrepreneurs are less likely to make uh, optimistic errors, to at least at the beginning. So they basically they are less likely to overestimate uh, their prospects, uh, but they are uh, also more likely to underestimate their prospects. So this is not very robust across the different measures, but. This is uh, consistent, you know, with the, the experimental literature. Um, entrepreneurs with college education, so they are more likely uh, to make uh, optimistic errors, and they are less likely uh, to make uh, pessimistic errors to underestimate their prospects. Uh, the fact that they have founded the company in the past, so serial entrepreneurs, doesn't seem to have an effect on the uh, on the fact that they are able, you know, to plan the future. Uh, what, but what is more uh, interesting is probably this uh, variable, so high growth oriented. 
that correspond so that is coded with a question in the survey so entrepreneurs they have to say so why do you want to found the company so they can say uh, because i want to develop the company or because i want to stay stay small and just create my own job and uh, entrepreneurs will say yes i want to develop the company so they are more likely you know to make uh, optimistic errors and they are less likely you know to underestimate uh, their prospects which is something that we could have expected but it's nice to see it in the data anyway Okay, and now about uh, updates. So basically, who updates? So I find that female entrepreneurs, they are less likely uh, to update, but they were also, you know, if you remember, less likely to make um, errors in terms of hiring. Um, so older uh, entrepreneurs, so older than 40 years old, so they are less likely uh, to, uh, to update or to, to learn. Uh, serial entrepreneurs, they seem to be more likely, you know, to update their expectations. And if you remember, they were not significantly uh, more likely to make uh, mistakes, which I think is interesting. And also, you know, um, uh, variables that are, uh, that may say something about the high growth orientation of the entrepreneur uh, also are also positively correlated with the likelihood of making an error. Okay. So, so far, uh, maybe I should pose for questions if there are any. Um. Um, so, I'm just, hold on. Uh, oh, so some, a good question. I'm curious why the choice to use hiring decision for measuring the forecast error, does it work with something like revenues if you have available? I don't think so, because you don't have the survey. So I use um, the say, yeah, I mean, yeah, there was no question about that. So. Okay. But is there any is there any sense that the because they have control on hiring that that is interpreted a little bit differently than something that they have less control over? Uh, I see. Uh, yeah, I mean potentially, but uh, that's why I include like individual fixed effect uh, to to control. But um, yeah, so it's a bit different from macro expectations. So in that sense, you know, they yeah they may control you know. Uh, but uh, what, but they may not, you know, necessarily, you know, remember what they say in the survey because it's, I mean, there is no really, you know, stakes about it. So, um, yeah. Uh, one one more, a good question. The economic magnitudes on those main results. Is there a? Uh... Uh, so here, uh, so we have dummy variable. So it's quite simple, you know, to uh, to interpret it. Uh, so uh, yeah. Okay. Uh, so, so you've got about eight yeah. eight and a half minutes. <laughs> okay. Perfect. Okay, so summary so far. So what have we learned? So entrepreneurs start with heterogeneous uh, beliefs. So they may start with, uh, you know, by making optimistic errors, pessimistic errors, and some of them, they actually don't make uh, any errors. And uh, I showed you and hopefully convince you that uh, entrepreneurs update depending on their uh, prior beliefs. So after making an error, they update. So the next question is, are initial beliefs and the formation of new beliefs, beliefs associated with better performance? And uh, the answer seems to be uh, yes. So here we have like uh, um, entrepreneurs uh, who made uh, optimistic error here and like the dots, uh, it's like the pessimistic errors and uh, the ones who don't make any errors in the first wave of the survey. And uh, what we find is that uh, after, so after a few, uh, so entrepreneurs who made optimistic errors and pessimistic errors in the first uh, wave of the survey. So they, after five years, so they are less likely to survive. So that's why you know, I explained you that even though there is a survival bias here, so the ones who learn, uh, they are uh, possibly uh, the, the ones who uh, basically uh, survive. Uh, so. Okay, so I also plotted like over uh, variables. So here, so, so it's also, you know, the optimistic error at start and the pessimistic error at start. And uh, what we can see here is that optimistic entrepreneurs, they, even after eight years, they are still underperforming uh, pessimistic entrepreneurs and uh, entrepreneurs who didn't make any mistake at start. Uh, so after, after several years, same in terms of sales, uh, and, uh, and in terms of uh, return over assets, so we even find that pessimistic entrepreneurs, they, they outperform uh, the rest. Okay, so let me show you the regression results. So, so consistent with what I said, so entrepreneurs who made uh, optimistic errors, so they are less likely uh, to grow in terms of sales, in terms of employment, and they are also less likely uh, to survive after uh, five years. 
um, but entrepreneurs who made optimistic errors and who updated, um, they are actually, you know, more likely uh, to, to grow in terms of sales and in terms of employment. So here we are within individual, so we're within firm, if you want. And uh, what we see is that the update in itself doesn't matter. So entrepreneurs uh, who update uh, don't have better performance, but only entrepreneurs who update after making an optimistic error are more likely uh, to grow in terms of sales or in terms of employment, or at least it mitigates you know, the, the adverse effect of uh, making an initial uh, optimistic uh, error. So if, now if we look across individuals, so I remove like the individual fixed effects and just include the sector cohort fixed effects, uh, because here it's like a demi viable uh, survival. So here I find that basically entrepreneurs who update, they are also the ones who made mistakes possibly. So that's why there is a negative correlation between the probability of uh, survival and uh, the update across individuals here. But same as before, so entrepreneurs who made an optimistic uh, error and who updated after that have a better performance, or at least it mitigates you know, the negative effect of making an initial uh, optimistic error. So entrepreneurs who made errors and who have updated, they grow more and they survive uh, longer. So to conclude and uh, to come back to the, the questions I asked in the introduction, so how accurate are entrepreneurs' expectations about their own business uh, future prospects? So I showed you that some entrepreneurs make optimistic errors, other entrepreneurs make uh, pessimistic errors. Okay, so there is like a quite large heterogeneity in terms of like the, 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 the initial beliefs of entrepreneurs. Uh, and these types are actually also persistent over time across individuals. So if you start as an optimistic person, you are likely to remain optimistic in the future, at least compared to uh, your peers in the same sector and who started the same year. Uh, second question, so do entrepreneurs learn from their errors? The answer is yes. So entrepreneurs update their biased beliefs after uh, making an expectation uh, error. And the likelihood of making errors declines with an individual over time. And uh, finally, I showed you that entrepreneurs who learn from their uh, errors grow more and survive uh, longer. So thank you very much. And I'm very uh, looking forward uh, David's comments. Wonderful. Thank you, Camille. So we're happy to hand the floor over to uh, David Pesmar, uh, who is going to have 15 minutes. Let's see if you can share your screen. <laughs> yes, thank you very much, uh, Michael, for the and song for the for the invitation. Uh, uh, let me see if I can share my screen. It looks like I can. Here we are. This is coming up. Yeah, looks good. All right, lovely. All right, thank you very much. Uh, so I have 15 minutes. Uh, I might be, I might go a bit shorter than this. I would make one point really. Um, but it's, uh, it's been a pleasure actually to think about this paper. Uh, it brought me back in time, uh, like 15 years back when we were doing a sort of similar analysis, not exactly that one, but on, on similar data. I think that paper expands significantly in the, in the direction of looking at, you know, dynamic of forecasts and also at like much longer, better data in a sense, because she's looking at much more data. So there's lots, there's lots of new things to do and I think it's great. Uh, so let me start with, uh, with this. So I like the pitch, even though I think the paper is going perhaps a bit too far at this stage. So the pitch is very simple. It's new ventures are highly uncertain. There's lots of uncertainty and there's lots of need for pivoting, you know, uh, so that's kind of a word uh, that, that you hear very often among entrepreneurs need to pivot because things change. And so you need flexibility. At the same time, it's not obvious because you could say also that entrepreneurs might need some persistence. It's exactly like when you're writing a paper, you know, you need to be able to pivot, but at the same time, you need to be able to persist also in the face of bad news. Uh, so there's a, um, so, so to test that hypothesis, whether flexibility of persistence kind of helps the growth of, of new ventures, uh, it's natural to look at expectations data because we have data on this. So that's something that we can observe and we can also compare with realization. So it's a nice idea. The problem is uh, that that question is very model dependent. It's very hard to, 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 to work on this question without a model. Uh, what is 
what news uh, requires adaptation to what news requires flexibility, uh, wh why you need persistence. There are plenty of stories one can tell to ourselves, and I think they are important and underexplored uh, with uh, rigorous applied microeconomics. Economics, but it's in the model. We need the model, I think, to, to go further than this. Uh, so, just to try to address that question, great data, the CNE survey. 25% of all French firms started in five different vintages. I think in our paper, we also, had, we also had 94. I don't know what happened to that year, but it's also a big year. Uh, maybe it's not on the, on the system anymore. I don't know. Uh, but there you have questions on sales and employment expectations. So there were questions on this in the chat, to which I answered, actually. Uh, so it's not just about are you going to hire or not, but also are you going to grow or not? And, that's, and you're going to you're going to uh, report those expectations one year after at the end of the first year of creation, three years after creation, five years after creation. So you've got a sequence. So that's great. So then you can match this with administrative data on firms account, on matched employer employee data. You can imagine the whole administrative data universe and plug into this, this very large survey that's conducted by the statistical office. Um, so that's a great idea. Very great, great setting to study expectation dynamics of entrepreneurs. I think it's unique data to do that. Uh, and Camille has a head start, and she will have done her paper uh, soon enough that you know she doesn't worry about competition. But you have to know that this data is available to people, so you can you, there's a there's a website you can access. Uh, it's like Danish data, but with much more data points. Okay, so it's like Danish data, but on steroids. You have much more data basically. So and that's possible to access even from the US. Uh, does it require some knowledge of French? That might help, even though you know the, the whole application process is in English. Uh, it's very open. Lots of people in Europe, even some in the US, I know that, are using this data. So I know it's possible. OK, that, that advertisement. I'm a former employee of the statistical office, so I felt I had to do this. Um, OK. Oh, ah, does it? Yes, OK. So that's a great insight. And my comment is going to be just really one comment. It's very simple. And I'm going to focus on uh, expectations formation dynamics. So I'm not going to focus on the link between you know, expectations formation and corporate outcome, which is also an important part of what Camille tries to address. And I think that's really important. But I think you know, let's um, go back a little bit and just you know, try first to try to understand the expectations formation process already. Let's just do that first, because that's already complicated. And then, you know, once we have settled this, and that's not going to be, and I'm not going to dismiss that, then we can move on to something that is more, uh, more complicated, which is, you know, how does the expectations formation process interact with how firms behave when they grow, which is, uh, I think, a second step. And so there are several papers in there, Mike. I mean, I, you should not just do one uh, that's going too fast and you're doing too much, too much things at the, at the same time. Uh, so, Expectations formation, very easy to study. That's beautiful because there is a lot of structure that's imposed by economic theories on, exp on expectations formation. So it can be, you know, rational expectations, which is what I'm going to do here just for the sake of, you know, the argument. But, you know, there are lots of models of the shelf of expectations formation that exist. And you should start from one of these. And the, simple, the simplest possible, the most parsimonious one, not the most realistic one, but the one that really fits, you know, uh, the data. Uh, and then, you know, we take this model seriously in the sense that, you know, quantitatively almost, uh, even though I'm not looking for, you know, a structural estimation, but, you know, something that is a real, let's take the model as seriously as possible in all its, you know, small predictions. So I could stop here, but it's a bit vague at this stage. So let me do it with a very simplistic example. Okay, so that's what I'm going to do. Okay, so I'm going to take the most simple example possible. Uh, and I'm going to try to fit just a subset of your moments. I'm not going to fit everything. There's going to fit, you know, three predictions that you find in the data. Okay. Uh, so let me note F X T plus one approach the subjective expectation. Um, so if uh, people are rational, it's going to be uh, capital E. It's going to be the you know the mathematical expectation. But you know, I write F as you know generic you know notation for for forecasts. Um, and here are the here are the, the the tables I try to I try to to understand. So one table shows me that forecast errors correlate uh, they correlate rather than predict. Ah, 
they correlate with changes in expectations. So that's this formula here. So if you look at this formula, what it tells you is that the change in expectations, so from, I don't know, year one to year three, I make two forecasts you know, of the future development and they change, okay? So that's the, what she calls the update, okay? And that thing correlates positively across you know, specifications with forecast error, okay? So there's one forecast error that, you know, if, uh, if, uh, if uh, so I think it's the opposite actually, actually, I think it should be negative, right? I don't know, I think that's all right, yeah. So, um, so that's, that's one correlation. Second correlation, uh, change in expectations predicts optimism. So here you have a forecast error, that's, uh, and that's, that's the update again, okay? But that's a predictive regression. So that's another table that she has. Third table is that forecast errors are negatively autocorrelated. So there's these two, okay? Uh, so that's, that's, a, that's, a, that's a prediction that she has. So that's quite a few moments, there are more actually. And let me try to write up a model, a very simple model and see how far it goes, you know? So let's, let's take the model seriously. So let's imagine that the true uh, performance of the firm, whatever that is, that is forecasted by the, by the entrepreneur, so it can be hiring or not. So that's an R1 process. So there's a first draw X note, which is when the guy starts and you know, X1 is already the first, you know, a forecast for the first period, X3, X5, uh, three, I mean, yes. And then, um, and then let's assume that people are rational. So I'm gonna make, I'm gonna be very simple, okay? And then don't have to be rational, but let's start with this. Uh, the real world is likely different. In particular, we know people are optimistic. So, you know, they have the average forecast is likely to be positive. That was our earlier paper with, with Augustin. She also has, you know, evidence to that effect in her, in her paper. That's fine. But let's start with this, okay? And let's write the hypothesis tested. So the first one looks at the link between forecast errors and change in expectations. Okay, so change in expectation is here. Forecast error is here, okay? Because it's an R1, this is the innovation here. This is the change in X. And so I should have a positive coefficient here. That is actually equal to, this is what the model predicts. It is actually equal to the persistence of the process. So if the process is persistent, then I'm gonna have that effect kind of mechanically. Second effect, does uh, change in, expectations predict optimism. So that's the update. That's, uh, that's the, uh, the, the forecast error here uh, that is supposed to encapsulate optimism. Uh, so here, if people are rational, you know, epsilon t plus one is, a co is orthogonal to, uh, to the change in uh, previous expectations. And as a result, uh, beta should be equal to zero. Forecast error are not predictable. That's kind of a definition. That's, uh, that's the baseline definition of rational expectations that you cannot predict forecast errors. Here in particular, because it's stuff that is in the information set, there's a whole set of theories that essentially say, you know, the information set of the entrepreneur might be smaller or the economic agent is smaller than what the econometrician sees. And as a result, when you project your forecast errors on what the econometrician sees, you can predict forecast errors. So that's the noisy expectation kind of models, you know, Woodford, et cetera. Uh, here, we are really re projecting uh, forecast, future forecast error on change of the entrepreneur's own expectations. So it's stuff that the guy knows because he has made those predictions. You know, there's no reason why he shouldn't know it. So that's a very strong test of uh, rational expectation. Uh, last, forecast errors are negatively correlated. So here it's just, you know, regressing epsilon t plus one and epsilon t. And again, we should find zero, okay? Because simply because epsilon t is the innovation, so it has to be correlated by definition again, again, by the fact that under rational expectations, forecast errors are predictable. So we know from Camille's uh, tables that these two predictions uh, are rejected. She finds a beta positive. So she has a negative sign here. It's a negative beta. There's a negative coefficient here. So, so rational expectation seems to, uh, to be uh, rejected. But let's, let's, uh, let's do this uh, a bit more uh, seriously and let's try to see what we get in uh, simulations. Okay, so what I do is that I simulate a panel 
of 15,000 firms over three periods. Um, so I'm having kind of the same similar structure as the data. So about, you know, even 20,000, I think I had, I don't know. I don't know what's correct. It doesn't change much. Uh, so it's a it's large data set, three periods, you know, so 60,000 firms in total. Uh, and then I generate the AR1 process. I make sure that the process has a similar, you know, uh, cross-sectional standard deviation as, as, as the outcome that, uh, of, of sales growth, uh, mean of 2% growth, and you know, some kind of persistence that is made up, doesn't really matter. And I assume full information, rational expectations, as I just did. And here is what I obtain when I run the, the regression, Camille's regression on, uh, on, uh, on, uh, on my simulated data. So I obtain what the CAMI obtains, which is that, you know, the regress change in expectations is positively correlated to, uh, to lag forecast error. So optimism predicts uh, uh, updates. Uh, updates do not predict, uh, sorry, I don't obtain, sorry, yeah, yes. So that's, that's what CAMI uh, predicts. And what CAMI finds here is that this is negative here and I don't find anything. So it looks like my model is rejected, right? which is my model is rational. So I cannot forecast forecast errors. But the thing is, of course, that uh, I have no fixed effects here. So if I was to add fixed effects, I would obtain the opposite. I mean, not the opposite. I would, that, that thing would still be there. It's positively correlated. Uh, and that's something that is close to, uh, to rho, which is uh, something that I would expect to have. Okay, so my rho is 0.2, I get point, you know, two, three. But that's, that's quite close. Um, however, you know, I can predict, you know, with updates, I can predict negatively forecast errors and I can also pass forecast errors. I can predict negatively future forecast errors. So I have mean reversion in forecast errors, uh, simply because my panel is too short. It's a mechanical outcome of the, you know, the candle bias or whatever you want to call it. Some people even call it the Stembo bias, even though I don't think that's exactly Stembo, but you know, candle nickel bias. You have a short sample, you add in fixed effect, you force the machine to find, you know, mechanical re mean reversion. Imagine two points. You try to place a line in between the two points. It looks like one po the first point is going to be above. The second point is going to be below. And it looks like, you know, it mean reverts. Uh, so you overestimate mean reversion in short panels. And that's a problem in those, in those expectation studies. Another problem is that uh, we're working with discrete variables here. Okay. So... In fact, everything is discretized. Okay, so here I, I, I wrote everything as if it was a continuous variable forecasted by a variable. But what we see here is a discretized forecast. Uh, and what Camille uh, does, exactly as we did at the time, is that she takes, you know, a discretized version of the realization and then she compares, you know, discrete realization with discrete forecast. If you do this again, you find kind of the results show up mechanically, uh, even with a rational. Uh, with a, with a rational um, uh, expectation uh, framework. Um, so that's simple. It's because, you know, when your forecast error, think about your forecast error is high. So you, for, you know, and so basically you are, I don't know, the realization is above your forecast. Since everything is discrete on the support of three, uh, you know, there are three possible values for forecast error, minus one, zero, or plus one. If you're at plus one, you have to go down to zero, or, you know, you, you cannot go higher at least. So. So that's generating, you know, the discretization is also generating um, mean reversion uh, uh, so that I can fit those three. Uh, I cannot fit all the tables uh, with this simple model. My point is that, you know, you have to take the model seriously, like down to really, uh, like you have to be very, uh, um, uh, very systematic about uh, what, what are the predictions of the, of the data. And that one actually does already quite a bit. I, in fact, I should not stop here, of course. Uh, I, I can match three moments. Uh, I mean, I'm not saying my model is uh, the right fit for Camille's data, uh, but I mean, we can construct more moments. For instance, we could take the realizations, look at the, 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 you know, the, the dynamics of realizations. So what is the I mean, realizations we can observe them so we can compute the R1 process that they correspond to and then, you know, try to fit I mean, use, use also what we observe in terms of realization to kind of, you know, back out what the true data generating process is. Uh, so that's going to have an impact on forecast formations. That's also part of the moments that you can observe. 
uh, the transition matrix essentially if it's discretized, um, etc., etc. And then you know once I understand my model well, then I'm happy to move on to the second step, which is reaction to big versus small news, reaction to micro versus macro news. Uh, heterogeneous, you know, uh, I don't know, information sets or whatnot or noise, etc. And then the relationship to the entrepreneur behavior, but that's really further down the line. Let's just make sure that we understand how entrepreneurs form their expectations first. I think that's kind of the, the first step. So I think this is, it would be my recommendation with this paper, need to write down the, more, the most parsimonious model of expectation dynamics uh, and look for moments. Um, what we did, just to give you a sense of what we did with Landier Desmar, it was extremely simple. So there was one dimension in, we, in which it was simple and, you know, in a sense, more closer, closer to, that, to that approach, which is that we were using discrete, discretized forecast errors and we were just starting from the idea that, you know, a forecast error is the sum of two things. That has to be true. The, the, the rational error plus the bias. Okay, by definition, just a, the decomposition of the forecast error. And we are saying, okay, we're going to use forecast error as a measure of bias, but a noisy one. Of course, it's noisy on many respects, and that's not something we were looking at, which is to say, okay, maybe, you know, uh, there's also another error here, which is coming from the fact that we are discretizing. And the, um, the variance of the underlying process is going to affect this third error that comes from the fact that we're discretizing something that is continuous. That is something that you should take, I think, more seriously than we did. Uh, uh, so that could be a first step. Uh, of course, what we were doing is also, uh, we were not doing, so we are not doing any simulations, etc. So, uh, you know, part of what I'm saying is, is a bit unfair, I have to say. But I think, I think at this stage, given the state of the literature on expectations formation, etc., I think you have to take the models of the shelf and really match them to, to the data, okay? And, um, and so just focus on expectations dynamics and then leave the rest for, uh, for, uh, for the rest. And, uh, okay, so that's it. Uh, it turns out that rejecting rational expectations, as you will see in the field, is quite hard, in particular if we don't observe exactly, you know, uh, forecast error. Okay, that's it. Thank you. Wonderful. Thanks so much, David. Uh, so, uh, Camille, do you want to respond to David's comments, and then maybe we'll go through some of the, the chat questions? Yeah, so thank you very much, uh, David, for uh, all of this. So that's a uh, lot to think uh, about, so in particular about the model. So, yeah, so thanks a lot, and uh, I agree with uh, all your points. So, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, yeah. Happy so, to send you the slides if you want. Yeah, thanks. Yeah. Or we can even discuss offline if you want, but that's okay. Uh, yeah, so maybe I can take a few questions. I didn't really have time to to select uh, the ones I, I would like to to uh, answer. So oh, here we go. Um, how about um, I'll start at the bottom. Okay. Uh, so yeah, the idea of connecting your data to shocks at this say industry year level. Is there any given your panel? Can you do that? Yeah, so I did it at some point. I didn't show it like today in the presentation, but when basically, so I, I tried like three types of shocks. So uh, macro shocks, uh, sector level shocks and uh, farm level uh, shocks. And uh, basically, so, so in, but to do that, I have like, you know, to remove like some sets of fixed effect. Uh, and, uh, but what I find is that uh, firm level and sector level uh, news have a little uh, explanatory power like relative to the mistake. So because I was, you know, trying to compare like the past expectation errors and like, uh, you know, this over news that may affect like the update. And I find that uh, they have a little effect, but macro shop, se macro shop seems to have like a, a more uh, effect, so. Okay, great. I think that actually answers the next question about whether the errors are bigger during more uncertain environments. So if you, in your panel over time, so I think you get that. Yeah, um, yeah, so yeah. But I could look more at, you know, the uncertainty at the sector level. I think that could be also something uh, interesting. Uh, that was also a comment suggested by David uh, about like, you know, the variance of the process, so yeah. Uh, oh, and so I think Matt Marx's question is similar uh, to what 
uh, we just saw in the discussion, but there, is there something mechanical going on with the sales dependent variable? Someone who makes an optimistic error will have a lower sales versus target. And essentially, are you controlling for the level of the original prediction? Yes. Yeah. Okay. So you are. Okay, cool. Um, and then I guess the, the, the notion that this is a two-sided decision. So uh, the supply side of hiring is a big piece of that is, I guess, are your fixed effects dealing with that or? Yeah, I mean, like there is uh, nothing really I can do about that or maybe control, you know, about like the quality of the employees. So that's not, you know, here I'm just looking at the employment growth. So whether they grow by one or two more employees, but potentially I could look, you know, at the quality or like what kind of people they hire at what wage. It's not something I'm doing at the moment, but that could speak, you know, about like the demand supply uh, side of hiring uh, potentially, but uh, yeah, but that's a good suggestion. But I'm not doing anything at the moment uh, about that. So okay, great, uh, Avri. I, I see you had a pretty, uh, I, I think, a philosophical issue. I wondered if you wanted to unmute and and ask it. I don't know if I'll do it justice. <laughs> sure. Thank you very much. So uh, great paper. I always like Camille's paper, and I was very much also. Um, uh, influenced by the paper by David and Augustin, which I discussed with Augustin in, in great length. So the philosophical question is, and I'll just try to make it, I've thought about it to make it a little shorter. Um, it could be that, I mean, what you're looking at is whether I'm managing the enterprise properly. So how do you tell the difference between somebody? So in other words, it could be someone who is very optimistic uh, like, you know, doing weird stuff, uh, Elon Musk or something, new things, and very risk-taking. And at the same time, he's very good at managing things. And, and the reason I ask it is because I was struck by your result that many of these people are pessimistic. We don't think of entrepreneurs as pessimistic. So maybe they're more realistic in terms of how to manage the enterprise. So that's the philosophical question. How do you tell these things apart? Thank you. Yeah, no, but actually I was like very surprised, you know, when I saw like so many, you know, pessimistic uh, entrepreneurs in the data because it's not, you know, the usual thing we hear. Um, but, okay, so maybe another way to interpret it is that these people may be more careful, you know, about like the way they manage the company. And actually what uh, the result seems to show is that these pessimistic people or these people who are more careful uh, they seem actually to perform better in the data. So, um, so yeah, no, so that's, uh, that's, right, uh, that's that very interesting. Great, yeah, Thank yeah. You. but I also like, you know, like your philosophical angle about the fact that optimistic people, they may take risk, uh, but they also may experiment. So I think that's something super interesting to disentangle. Uh, I, I don't know how I could do that, but it's something that uh, I like uh, thinking about. So, yeah. Thank you. Wonderful. Um, if anyone has a question not in the chat, well, feel free to unmute. Um, I think we've hit most of them. Okay. Usually the rule is 30 seconds, but I, I'll, uh, I'll let the silence tell us. So thank you to the presenter and discussant uh, for a great paper and feedback. Our next talk is in a couple weeks. Uh, stay tuned for that. Um, uh, over email. Otherwise, I'll, we'll see you uh, at that talk, hopefully, in future ones. Thanks, everyone, for coming.